So this is the use Perl buff or whatever it's called. Uh, the annual meeting of the Debian Perl group. I think it's the third time we are having this. We started it in Argentina. Last year we even had two meetings in Cáceres. And well, I, I submitted the talk to Penta so that it's there and that we get, the, get it scheduled and that we get it video teamed for all the people who are at home and hopefully are awake. Um, apart from that, there's not m much I want to say now and I will leave this position here because it feels rather awkward for a <coughs> team meeting to stand on the stage. What I have prepared is this, this copy document so that we have some kind of structure. I would like to ask you to help me in taking notes or to maybe actually do the note taking. Is someone familiar with copy? Jeremiah? Yeah. yeah. Cool, thank you. Okay, uh, someone should probably also follow uh, hash Debian Perl on IRC. That's where the Perl folks hang out. Damian was just asking if there's something going on. David? Ah, right, thank you. Okay, and on the wiki page, there, there is this Debian Perl group open tasks page, which is, well, there since three years or something, just for collecting ideas, which we can talk about now. Uh, I've copied some of them out, and I can, well, I can offer to lead a bit through, the, through this session. I can also offer to to take this copy thing afterwards and write it into, or well bring it into some readable form and send it to the mailing list. Yeah, and I think now we can just start. W what I would like to start with is what's called introduction here. Okay. <laughs> oh, that was not my plan. Okay, I go away. <laughs> yeah, let's let's move together a bit. Thank you. Perfect. I think it might be nice for the people following along along at home to uh, connect faces to nicknames. So maybe we can just say our names and wave into the camera as a short start. So I'm Gregor. I'm Crispy. I'm Jonathan or Noodles. I'm David Bremner. I'm John Leitze. Hi, I'm Jeremiah Foster. Hi, I'm Roberto Sanchez. I'm Roberto Sanchez and I go by El Cubano on IRC. Does this work? Oh yeah, I'm Tim. Uh, Ritu. I am Jonas. I go by Jonas on IRC when I'm seldom there. Uh, my name is Matt Zagrabelny. I'm uh, Jolder or Jolder on IRC. <laughs> I am not part of the team, but I'm Peter Di Camillo. Okay, <laughs> some people are hiding in the back. Good. Um, well, we could maybe start with the first um, issue. The there's also an annual question about our VCS use. Usually it goes like this, that oh, some of the younger, enthusiastic uh, Git fanboys... <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally objective, I know. <laughs> <laughs> that some of the more progressive guys uh, come up and, and say, hey, why are we still using SVN? And then some of the older guys are asking, well, um, has anyone figured out how Git works for 1,700 1, packages? And then there are some people who say they will look into this issue and try to, try to see if it could work. So I think the question is, has there been some research in the last year? Can someone say something about it? 
Yeah, I, d- I don't know if anyone else has looked at it recently. So I, I looked at it last year, and actually, um, I've I've given up on uh, on getting it to work for the moment. I mean, I just um, trying to put scripts together that clone seventeen hundred Git repositories or whatever is is quite difficult uh, to get it as quick as SVN. Um, that's what I found anyway. Um, I think. Um, it's. I'm not. I'm not saying it's impossible, but you know, someone has to actually care about it enough. So, uh, as far as Git with multiple packages, I know uh, I maintain Shorewall, which has about a half a dozen uh, different products that upstream releases, and I hack, had to hack together a shell script. Um, Probably should have done it in Perl, but I picked Shell. That was what was what just made sense at the moment um, to do it. And it, um, I mean, I make it work, um, but that's a half a dozen packages. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I mean, I'm bef- la- if you would have asked me last year, I would have been completely opposed to using Git. But Shorewall Upstream has gone to it, so I had to move with it, and and several of my clients use it, and so I've had to learn it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not opposed to it, but you know we need to figure out what the technical challenges are. I don't know. Does does Git allow you to, like you know with SVN you can check out, like just a directory. So if you want just the one package, is there something similar with Git, or do you have to clone the whole repository? You, know? you can check out single items. Okay. Yeah, you can check out single items. You can say uh, Git check out foo and check out a file. Yeah. So the the thing is that it's it's quite tricky to do that. Um, the w- the the way yeah. yeah, I mean the, the way we work at the moment is we have one big SVN repository, and I think ideally, if if we are going to get, then it would be. I I mean I'd assume the the way we do it would be one repository per package. Do you reckon? Get get check out foo would change the branch. Would it not? Uh, no, I think you have to explicitly say you d- you'd change a branch. You're just How big is the SVN repo? The just the checkout checked out copy. Disk wise, yeah. Tr- trunk has about two gigabytes at the moment. What? Well, uh, I'm I'm one of the fanboys. Just to mm-hmm. reveal that. Um, <laughs> I I thought that there was someone more clever than me that was also w- already working on these kinds of things. But 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 if if the ones I don't know if you were with the one of those working on it earlier on, like last year I heard that oh some b- people were actually hacking on this problem. Uh, maybe I'm actually then stepping up or something to look at it because I really want to continue working on Git. But one of the things that if you're measuring speeds is that when you're when you're doing a checkout of, of Git. Uh, packaging uh, packages 1700 uh, packages uh, then you are checking out all of the history when you're checking out subversion you are not checking out all of the history and one of the things I would try <coughs> what would be to there is a trick to say uh, check out and don't pull out the whole history only check out the latest 10 revisions or whatever layer you want what depth you want and I believe that means that you cannot then later on edit on something that wasn't checked out yet I don't think it's, it's something you can then uh, ro- work further on that's one of the, the flaws of that. But you can you can certainly build up on top of it. You cannot do all the juggling anymore. You lose something, and you need to then check out a deeper depth. But that's what's one of the things I would wor- be working on. But but if y- there's some clever guys that are semi-clever that has some experience or some tried out some scripts and something, I would be happy to have those to start out from instead of starting from scratch. So now to to clarify, the issue really isn't. Git itself, right? It's Git build package. Is that no? Git itself is is part of the problem. So I I have a question from Ansgar on IRC, and he asks, do we need checkouts of the whole tree? And uh, I guess that sometimes we do. We have the the habit of doing global changes occasionally, but when we need them, it's quite important. We we do need this, right? Yeah. I agree that we need we need to be able to check out the whole tree and work on things across the packages, not the thi- kind of things I have been working on, but I, I certainly know that others uh, need that. And uh, 
but but normally we would need to, uh, the, the logic of of git is fundamentally that it 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 has just it has do don't have work in revisions it works in in uh, in in deltas so you need to have the roots to have all deltas so to uh, calculate all possible deltas so that's the reason that when you check uh, when you when you clone a git when you pull it down you cannot say i o i only want to have the latest revision you, you, you can you can do that, but that's like a hack. It's not really wha how the Git, uh, Git, Git is working fundamentally. So okay, so so th that's one of the. It's not a bug in Git, but it's just one of the fundamental differences in the approaches to version control that is in subversion. Uh, I don't think we should go into the, the, the deep depth um, of, of what is the differences here because it's not a, it's not a competition. I think yeah. it's just that if anybody, w if, if if the fanboys is want to want to uh, try have solve this issue of uh, do something that ca that the old guys can approve that it's working for them too, then we could try that out. And if the fanboys cannot s solve this issue, then we should just stick to subversion. It's not, it's not obsolete. Subversion is only, we're only discussing this because us fanboys want to switch, right? That's the only reason we are. So, so right. I, I'd like to reiterate a comment Dan made, but he didn't sign his name in Gobby, but I can tell from the color, I is that really this discussion is premature because we can't work seriously with Git until we have the entropy tracker running for Git. And so I think the first step for us Git fanboys is if we want to devote effort to this, that's where we should focus is getting the PET working for Git repos because we already have some things in Git and, it, and they're for non CPAN modules and that works fine except that it gets left out of our usual workflow, and so I guess that's not fine, really. <laughs> I mean, uh, I was just going to say that two, uh, in my opinion, non-fanboyish re reasons to move to Git are nowadays it seems that more and more uh, upstream Perl development is happening on places like GitHub, you know, and that kind of makes it easier to uh, to hook into that. And second. Um, Git seems to be a lot more compact. I mean, I tried to do a full SVN checkout once, and it's just a huge amount of disk space it takes up, while an equivalent Git repository seems to be a lot more, uh, you know, disk-friendly. So for what that's worth. Thank you. What do you think about that? Well, GitHub, GitHub is seems to be the place where all the development is going on lately, I think, for a lot of Perl modules. I forgot what I want to say. So <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to sum up this point a bit because it's already 20 minutes into the talk. Um, I guess we're, we are at a similar status like last year or the year <laughs> before. Um, so if, if, if there's a path to switch, then we can consider switching it, which w would mean we need the tools and we would need a migration plan. So the question is still, is there someone interested in working on it? Um, I, I, I actually, yeah, I agree with this point from, from Dan, actually, that um, maybe the first step is actually just to get, we, we do have a few things in Git already. If we can actually integrate those with PET, then that's much easier. Uh, sorry, I'll give this back. Um, just a short uh, comment. Ansgar has been working on... on Pet two or something with multi. Oh. Uh, where's the source code for uh, pet .cgi located? Uh, it's on Elioth. It's a uh, separate project, pet or pet Yeah, but um, um, I would look at the stuff Anscar's been doing. I I got it running um, on Git, and uh, it looks good actually, and the code's a lot cleaner. Um, um but obviously we've got to we've got to finish that off and actually get that deployed first if we c if we can actually get the the stuff we've already got working then um scaling it up to to everything is is the next challenge i think um we could also do it gradually right and and uh move packages i mean if it's seamless whether a package is in git or s v n which i think is our goal uh then well we'll move things over and by the time we have everything moved over, we'll have the scalability problem <laughs> figured out. Or we'll really be in trouble. 
I really don't uh, use IRC as so and the pet is tied to IRC as I understand it. So Okay. You don't need HTTP interfaces with Git, okay? But uh, <laughs> I would I would like to to step up, hopefully not alone, to uh, work on the the, 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 the speedy of the speediness of uh, handling the packaging itself. But I don't think I I, I will not step up. I, I'm not capable of, of, of hacking the the pet tool. I don't use it myself, and I would need to get used to that first. So I would be need to be dragged into the pet uh, development. You know my email, you can get a hold of me if you want to convince me, but I would like to step up and take over the uh, the try on speeding up the packaging handling itself. So put my name on that, but not the pets yet. Actually, he didn't volunteer for pet hacking. <laughs> but he volunteered for Git not pet hacking. Yes. Good, and I think <laughs> Okay, so I guess if is this working? Ah, right. If there's some progress, we will get the report on the mailing list, and then then we'll see. Thanks for your offer. I'll look. <laughs> yeah, put me down for some half-hearted commitment to pet as well. <laughs> cool. Thank you, David. Okay. So this next um, issue, I'm not really sure if this is an issue. It's also something we've been discussing <laughs> since at least Argentina. Uh, someone asked on the mailing list today what this was all about. Um, there was a time when some of us were not really happy about module install because it copy itsel copies itself into each and every module, which is code copy on the one hand, and which also carries around buggy versions for months that are fixed in, in module install itself, but not in the modules using it. So two years ago, over a beer, we had the idea of maybe um, making our unhappiness public. It has never really happened. Dam has already written here that, mm, well, maybe talking to the author would be more useful. I don't know if this is an issue for, for anybody anymore. My my impression is that module install use is going down, that distiller is going up, and well, David? Do we have any measurements of, of the actual use or possible easy ways to I directly measure who is using it? I know my CDBS packages, but I can count them by hand, but uh, other than that. Um, I don't know if I'm up to speed. What's the problem with module install? I, I <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's old, I know. Are people using build? Uh, um, I, was, uh, I was just making a derogatory comment about module install. No, I, I think it, it is actually relatively new, and there were some upstream pedal authors who quite liked it. But the problem with it is... Um, co-copying really that uh, the duplication and the old bugs and all of that stuff I think um, uh, I think DH7 handles it specially I, I forget how we um, how that actually works internally this is about a module out to install that Depel percent 7 to 13 sets the correct flag so the module out to install doesn't try to download anything I mean, if if someone still if are we the so the question is are we still going to write this letter, um, or is it worth just leaving it? I'm happy to help with um, 
drafting that. Um, but we have to agree whether to do it and what to put in there. So Perl has, I think, a complicated set of build tools, make maker, uh, make install, and make build. And I don't know if they're evenly divided in the Perl community um, between those three, but I do think make, install, and, and module build are more widely used. Um, Adam Kennedy is a very prolific and hardworking developer who has strong opinions, naturally, and works a great deal on the Windows platform. But I suspect that he might not uh, be so keen to have some kind of public broadside um, against him. So I think, I th definitely think talking with him first would help. How about um, how about actually turning it into a positive kind of spin and um, writing a letter supporting module build or something like that? If I remember correctly, some of the, the tool chain guys at M. I'm not sure if it was Adam or someone else, who was in, in the Debian Perl IRC channel at some, some point and, and he said, well, yes, please tell me what's wrong with it and please let's work together. So something like this open letter we had in mind two years ago is pro probably really the way not to go. Yeah. So and if someone has some strong issues, then contacting the author is, well, seems reasonable. Well, perhaps one way of doing it is to, you know, in, in order to keep it positive, is to have some kind of uh, um, article or something in some widely read Perl forum of, like, how you can help get your module packaged for Debian. And, like, the kind of things that would help us along so that they get promoted as best practices kind of thing. And then things like module install just fall away because not the uh, best practices anymore. Yeah, so the, the package Ruby team has on, on their page, they have a like uh, open letter to upstream. I'm, I don't know if you've seen it, but you know, it's basically if you are an upstream developer of a Ruby module, here are things you can do to make it easier for us to package for Debian and we should probably do something similar for, the, for Perl. Right, so we can, you know, if we can, as a group, we can come to a consensus as to what we think best practices are, you know, capture that all in a web page, and then start spamming, you know, for lack of a better term, that the URL to that, you know, out into the Perl community where people are developing modules, and hopefully they'll see it, and, and that'll, you know, help make uh, the quality of the Perl modules better for everybody, and then also easier for us to package into Debian. So I have a question from Dan on IRC. He asks, is module install still a burden to to the heroes of the day, he writes, of which I, I presume, I'm not sure if that means us in the buff or or what, but uh, so I guess, is this still a real problem? There was some discussion of this earlier and, right? Gregor shakes his head. In my opinion, it's not, not a real problem. It's ugly to have those code copies flying around, but well, so be it. And regarding this, this uh, best practice stuff, uh, there are some checks in, the in this quality, or however that's spelled, uh, K-W-A-L-I-T-E -E packages and uh, Gabor Schabo, however his name is pronounced correctly, is always very interested in, in working together with distributions and getting stuff in there. Yeah, so that's also a, a good way to go. But uh, in my personal opinion, we could just um, tick off this module install thing and be done with it. Unless, some, I, mean, I mean, if someone wants to, to, to draft some best practice recommendation or whatever, that, that's always fine, but it's not worth a, grou a group effort, in my opinion. What do you think is really key, um, or what should be the high priorities for the group effort, do you think? That's a good question, actually. <laughs> RC bugs? Yeah. I guess the, the, Im the immediate stuff is fixing bugs in the long term stuff is is keeping the high quality of the <coughs> of the the packages 
which means making some changes over them, um, following best practices in Debian packaging. I mean, that's the, that's the next question, actually. Okay, so let's move on. Good. Um, the next one is about a proposal I sent to the mailing list about adding a paragraph to our totally internal Debian Perl group policy. I don't know how many people have read this. There was, I think, yeah, w w w we had a kind of, kind of side discussion and, and Salvatore uh, replied to it. Okay, so I, I will put it on screen. No, it's it, it won't be large enough for um, for people on the video stream. I think I think the font will just need. Oh, they've got a link. Okay. <laughs> just click on the hyperlink in the video stream. Oh, wait. <laughs> uh, well, no, the, the, the question is how many uh, old versions of dependencies do we want to support? So like in the, the example where we, if, if a mo module needs to test more larger than 0 0.88, then we write it as Perl larger than 5.10.1 or lib test simple. Uh -huh. Okay. And the more or less common practice so far was to, to add versions to dependencies if there is an older version of the required package in old stable or unstable and to remove the version is if there is no older package anywhere and also to write these alternatives if the uh, well if Perl in in stable or un, uh, old stable doesn't uh, have this module included. Yeah, and the idea is just to, to, to write it down that let's write the versions there as long as there are all the versions available and otherwise just skip it. Just to make it very clear, also because of our dis discussions on the mailing list, I completely agree with, th with this part of the proposal, or this, this proposal. Uh, it makes very good sense to me that to, to say that the limit where we cut off is uh, when Debian do not no do no longer provide support for the packages. We no longer provide uh, fallback mechanisms for the packages. Is this something we we already do yeah. anyway? So yeah, just, about it down. Just, just a clarification and then and reaffirming. Rea since hardly anybody replied in the mailing list, I thought let's ask here again before I commit it. Mm. Okay, then I will commit it afterwards. No, <laughs> nice chat. <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> it would be good, I think, if we could clarify exactly what this means for end users. I think some people will come to Debian and say, okay, I want. Um, this module, it will pull in a bunch of modules. Maybe one will be missing and they'll have to go to an older version. Maybe we'll want to make that clear. I think you're touching the other part of the discussion now. If we actually support older versions of the system, 
because uh, this really is just a theoretical things of others borrowing our packages and then they have to deal with however they want to want to have things working or people cherry picking a package from a newer and then running old stable so this is this is not about us backporting to stable or making them th this is a different issue i think if if i understand your question correctly this is this this really does not touch any of the issues of people mixing across distributions or in across time Let's keep that secret. Uh, se se separate, <laughs> not secret. <laughs> separate. <laughs> yeah, but we we can also look into this uh, this issue. Yeah. So I know that's important for you. Um, as I understand, there was for the for this other issue of, of how 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 far back do we want to to uh, support backports or backportability of our packages? Uh, there are two styles one style is we don't really care unless we are really lazy with our packaging which uh, uh, typically works as fine uh, too uh, and the other one is like we want to keep back portability and we w even want to hurt ourselves a little bit by doing so a little more details is that uh, dep helper 7 dep helper 7 point different subversions of that provides improved uh, handling of for instance this what we just talked about before the one of the um, make make maker or yeah make install um, and that was added in a fairly recent version of dev helper a version that is not in the current stable which means that if we then want to ensure that it works correctly then we want to uh, limit to only working with this current version of Depelper, which means that we cannot just take that package and rebuild it for stable anymore. It will work in binary packages from unstable, will work in stable, but the principles of recompiling packages in stable will not work. It will break, it will require a, re a backport of Depelper itself too. And then we can go into details of saying, whoa, yeah, sure, but uh, people can just backport Depelper, and there is already backports.org, but backports.org is not Debian. It's not Debian stable. So we could try to make a l a different kinds of cuts saying that we support these kinds of unofficial mixtures of packages. I really would suggest that we just focus on how much official Debian do we support and, and keep the discussion to that. And I imagine that it's pretty simple and short and saying that, well, I'm a fanboy of backports. There might be one more fanboy of backports. I suspect that the common sense would be, hey, most people use their purple, most people want to use their purple 7.2, which means the discussion is moot. We, we really want to use funky new features. Damn, if only all of you used CDBS, there would be no problem because it, would it has been working correctly with all also with the other uh, MakeMaker tools since 2004, if I believe correctly. Squeeze my little advertising into it. We are just holding the mic. <laughs> yeah, the, the question is, is how much do we want to hurt ourselves? At which costs do we want to support the uh, uh, possibility for backports? I also guess the consensus is um, supported where it's easy, but don't hurt ourselves too much by not using new tools that make stuff easier. I think I think I saw a discussion about this on RC uh, a couple of months ago, and about backports. And um, I think it would be really interesting to um, routinely backport our packages automatically, something like that. But um, yeah, maybe we should fix all the RC bugs first, or something like that. So, so Ansgar has a question on on IRC, and he says, "Aren't there plans to make backports an official part of Debian anyway? Can anybody?" Yes. So that would be a point at which we would presumably be more interested in supporting it? I, uh, I think from what I heard, which may not be all the details, backports.org will become part of the you know Debian family officially. We won't be supported to the extent that stable will. It'll still be a kind of... Uh, unofficial kind of thing. It's just in terms of inf infrastructure and so on. I think they will. Yeah. One, one thing that 
I know of currently is, is, is hitting this. Just, just a practical, concrete example is this, uh, about if you're using a specific uh, make, uh, build uh, mechanism then and, and using their helper, then you would want to uh, limit, hurt, hurt uh, that portability. What I would suggest that we say is that in general, if there is no explicit reason for limiting back portability, then let's be open to backports, which then allows us to later on make funky uh, rules, uh, routines to try to backport, and then we can tag which packages did not backport for which reason. Oh, because it used this annoying uh, build uh, mechanism, and that's maybe one brick too in the get rid of that build system. But but like it could be different. As I said, TDBS is working since 2004 nicely. So hit me again, okay? Will you? <laughs> no. But it it the for the for for the when we were running Lenny and it was backporting to Edge, we had different problems of uh, different reasons that people were taking the the newer versions. That was the whole rewriting into short form DH. That was so that was a nicety, you could say. It was not a necessity, uh, but but still, it was a thing, thing that didn't hurt us that uh, that much. So I'll just I'll just say let's let's keep it open in the future. What will be the reasons for for tightening? And if there is no explicit reason, then don't just uh, routinely tighten packaging because it might hit something, in my opinion. <coughs> yeah, it's difficult to disagree because it's a very good argument. But there's there's one point mm, I'm not so happy about. And that is if you keep, for example, the DEP helper versions and features down for the packages this that exist, and then you have new packages which are created with a new DEP helper version, and then you have packages which are created with an even new DEP helper version, then you have uh, whole generations of, of variants of Debian rules files in the, in the repository. And well, it's a bit annoying. Jonas is going to mention CDBS in a second, if you're <laughs> not careful. <laughs> oh, in, in and CDBS hasn't changed since 2004? No, that's, <laughs> that's the main problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so any, any conclusions on this? Yeah, 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 that, that one. This was this was the next discussion yet. Okay. Yeah, Dam Damian also wrote it supporting old stable when not hard is preferred until it hits archive. Okay, good. Let's go to the next question. That was yours. Yeah, I just wondered um now that we've frozen, do does the does this affect our workflow in any way? Um do we continue to upgrade things in our SVN just waiting for squeeze plus one or do we put hold on that and start you know squashing bugs more release candidate box of course always comes first uh, case but I mean I don't see any reason technically it it could really be shortened down to read the release email it has details, instruction on how to deal with this current situation of should you then stop working or should you uh, not release our packages anymore. And even if we have the package that we would really like to have in Squeeze, there's still a chance to do that. The change now is that you need to convince someone else. You are not anymore just relying on the systems of 10 days in, in, in Unstable. So, but but re read the email. That it, it really applies to, to Perl too. I don't think we need a special style. Oh? I think that there's uh, two bits in that. One is, um, should we push new packages to Unstable? And I would say the answer to that is definitely no, in case there are problems that come up that are can be fixed by a minor patch. Um, there's a question then about should we move on full steam ahead in SVN so that once we release we have stuff ready to go. Um, I haven't done anything complicated with our SVN thing, but uh, we don't do branching or anything like that, do we? So it, it may be that the way our current setup works, it may not be a good idea to do it because if we end up having to do a minor patch on a package that's already in unstable, then it may be a case of rolling it back. That might be an argument for the fanboys to use about Git. 
So, so something to to consider there is, I mean, I, I was going to say something similar to what you said about we probably should not be uploading new upstream versions um, to uh, to unstable. Um, one of my other packages that I maintain upstream, I've been working with them. They just released a new release last night, and then you know today I just didn't get around to packaging it last night. Today, squeeze is frozen. It's you know it's a couple hundred lines of diff. So I sent the diff to Debian release asking you know, for pre-approval. So I think in cases where we have modules that are historically not buggy, you know, if a new upstream comes <coughs> out and, you know, it's a relatively, you know, easy diff, I think for those cases, we, you know, we can probably just take the diff, email it to Debian release and ask for a pre-approval for, for a new upstream. They'll do that. We're still pretty early in the freeze. Now, as we get later, it's going to get harder. But, I, I mean, I don't, I don't see why we need to, I mean, the worst thing they can do is look at it and say no. You know what I mean? So, I, I, so, so all I'm saying is, you know, if you have a package and a new upstream release comes out and it's a few hundred lines of diff or, or whatever, something that's simple, maybe just documentation changes, you know, we can always ask and, and that way we can continue the work on some level without just bringing everything to a grinding halt. Yeah, I, I was going to say that I, I think the, uh, the, the release managers are mainly going to be, uh, you know, um, concerned about things that, you know, really drastically change the dependencies. So you might have some chance of getting, like, little individual Perl modules that don't depend on anything. Uh, th that might, uh, you know, that might not be such a, th such a problem getting things like that in. I, but uh, well, well yeah. also every simple change we throw at the release managers is time taken away from them looking at the more complex release critical bug fixing thing. So yeah, we look at it and we go, this is a hundred line diff. It's mostly documentation. Yeah. If it's a hundred line diff, and mostly documentation, then convince me that it's important enough to actually raise the release team's time on it. Yes, it's a nice, but if it's not fixing a release critical bug, I would argue that we should hold off. The principle of the freeze is we're trying to get released rather than trying to squeeze everything we can in. And, and, and they're already overloaded. Um. And uh, I was just going to add one more thing that I think that one thing we should try and, uh, uh, try and s uh, sneak in if we can is uh, Rakuto. Uh, what with the, uh, yeah, Rakuto star just came out and it would really suck if like the next, you know, one and a half years we didn't have but Parrot, I thought, was up to date. Yeah, I, 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 I think we have a recent enough. This is not the group. Uh, but right. <coughs> but I mean, if that's the, you know, there's nothing depending on it. And it, you know, because it's new code, that shouldn't be uh, a big problem. I, I don't Five know. minutes, that's not good. Uh, I was a bit confused by the discussion before. I think it, uh, there, there are two issues. Do we want to get something to squeeze? And I agree that it's not worth overloading release managers with some strange Perl so modules. So we pick our battles. But, but, <laughs> but the other interesting question is, uh, do we still upload to unstable or are we taking a holiday for six months now? And historically, for the last two releases, we have just continued to upload to, to unstable. It can lead to problems if we need to fix a bug in, <coughs> in testing, right? But that was very rare. And if I look at the, at the amount of new upstream releases we have, I guess that's around five new each day or something like that. And we have um, uh, a freeze of four months. And I mean, I don't, <coughs> I, I don't think it's realistic to say, okay, we don't upload anything to Unstable now, wait until Christmas and then upload 1,000 packages. That just doesn't work. So I guess it's important to, to be careful, maybe not upload uh, critical packages where th which have many R depends, but just stopping to work um, doesn't sound like a good idea. SVN, oh wow, that's really loud. Um. SVN does have branching. I mean, it doesn't have merging, but it does have <laughs> branching. <laughs> well, if, if it's a case of we're worried about an unlikely needing to 
diff against uh I guess we can just check out an old version or something and work from that. I, I mean, I'm just thinking, should we do something now? Should we take a snapshot? Should we branch off a s trunk, a squeeze? I mean, I'm a Git person, right? So if in doubt, branch. Um, but that's the first stage of every Git workflow is branch. So yeah, I, I guess that, that, that probably is a good way to go because in, in reality, um, you know, we can always go back to whatever version was in testing, right, or is in testing if we have to fix a bug in testing, branch from there, and in reality, are we going to have to merge? Probably not, and if anything, if it's like to fix a, a new bug that comes up, you know, it's it's simple, and that these are, you know, we're at this point, we're talking probably like max 29 line diffs if we're going to get past the release managers with it, you can diff and then just apply it, you know, to the head and in, in a stable. So it, it's kind of a, cl a kludge because, like you said, there really isn't decent merge support and subversion. But uh, yeah, it, it probably makes sense to do it to just plan to do it that way. That if we need to, we go back to whatever version was in testing and just branch off of there. Yeah, I mean that that's what we're doing for for stable proposed updates. There, there, there's a branches Lenny which has don't know five packages now. Well, maybe it's ten because we've added three this week. Ansgar has edited them, I've up uploaded them. Yeah, that works fine for these cases. Okay, anything else on squeeze, freeze? One more SVN ignorant question. So so it's no problem to check out an old version and branch from there? No, okay, no, great. no, that's no problem. Okay. They are all tagged, you could just copy the tag to a branch. Yeah, I know it sounds weird <laughs> for, for Git people to copy a tag to a branch, but it, this works, yeah. As long as you don't merge afterwards. Uh, right, <laughs> which we don't plan to, so it's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, something like two, mi two minutes. Okay, so this, this list of work and tools, well, it's, it's in the wiki. If you like to work on something, do it. But there's not really much left. So I'd like to leave the last minute we have to Jonas and some advertisement we have been asked to do here. I'm involved in, a, in packaging a tool for LDAP administration called Zipux. Uh, it's uh, actively used for some years in Germany. Uh, quite some years uh, the author, the upstream author, has used it for five, six, seven, eight years, something like that. But uh, it is the, the current the major branch of it has been used for uh, developed during the last two we two years and used in school Linux in Germany. There is one maintainer upstream, and it could be super cool if this project could have some more help upstream in developing. It is a it is considered by us in school Linux in Germany as a very crucial tool to have. At the moment, for LDAP ad administration, there is only a very general br uh, browser-like tools to uh, look around in, 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 in LDAP structures and a uh, PHP-based uh, tool called Gosa, which is entering uh, testing now. There is no, in my opinion, reliable tool to handle LDAP. And this is just a little advertising. If anybody could be curious about look maybe looking, helping looking at helping out upstream with packaging maybe parts of this Zipbox, uh, some plugging structure and stuff, uh, and working on getting it into Zip, uh, into CPAN. It is not currently in CPAN. Upstream author wants the next major release to be fully inside CPAN, but he needs help with some clever people. Then we would very much appreciate it. Okay, is there anything left we can discuss in the last 10 seconds we have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the, the idea was to, to go outside after the, the talk to <coughs> give the video team our thanks and then some free time and do some more key signings for those who haven't yet. Well, and other than that, thanks for coming. Let's continue working L together. I'd hmm. like to thank Gregor for all his work for the team. And Dam also, even though he's not here, he's done a huge amount. And I'm sorry for the other people whose names I didn't mention, but. Yeah, what's great about DevConf is you get to come and, and thank in person all these people who've done so much work for you. So I'd, I'd like to say thank you very much, Gregor and Dam.